So today I'm delighted to be joined by Sir Howard Davies, the chairman of NatWest Group, uh, to discuss the future of the financial system. Sir Howard has held a variety of roles in the financial system, from deputy of the Bank of England to currently holding a position at Millennium Management on their compliance advisory board. Uh, he joined. He became chairman of NatWest Group in 2015. Um, and just to start, I just want to ask, could you please give a brief overview of your career um, in the financial sector uh, to audiences who don't um, recognise or know your work? Yes, well, if you take a broad definition of the financial sector, also to include the Treasury, uh, which um, is perhaps a bit of a stretch, but nonetheless. So I joined the Treasury in uh, 1976 and worked there until 1982. But then for uh, the next 13 years, I was not in the financial sector at all. So I was at McKinsey, <clears throat> although I did have some financial clients. And then um, at the uh, Audit Commission, and then the CBI. Um, and then I mm -hmm. was plucked out of the CBI in 1995 by the then government well, actually the chancellor was uh, kenneth clark yeah. and he asked me to go into the bank of england to be deputy governor the the reason for it was uh, not something i could possibly have planned in that the previous deputy governor um committed an indiscretion by having a uh, an affair with a financial journalist uh, some of which took place actually in the bank of england <laughs> and so uh, he had to resign, and I was uh, brought in in 95. And then in 97, um, what happened was that the Labour government came in under Blair and Brown, and they decided to reorganise financial regulation and set up a single regulator, the Financial Services Authority, and to make the Bank of England independent from a monetary policy point of view. And in order to make that reform more acceptable, I guess, to the city. They said, okay, well, we're going to make this big reform, but the existing governor, that time Eddie George, will remain the governor, and the existing deputy governor, and there was only one at that point, will become the chairman of the FSA, and that was me. So that, you know, it'll be in some ways business as usual, because the same two people will be in charge, but we will have a, an institutional restructuring. And I stayed at the FSA uh, until... 2000 and uh, end of 2003 and then I went to run the London School of Economics mm -hmm. uh, from 03 to 2011 and then after that uh, I became chairman of uh, Phoenix which is now actually now a rather large life insurance yep. company recently bought uh, Standard Life and a, a lot of yep. other life funds and then um, that I did that till 2015 when I became the chairman of NatWest, as you said. So uh, I've been insurance, banking, regulation, central banking uh, in, a, in these different roles now for most of my career. Uh, okay, that's great. Um, I want to kind of dive a bit deeper into your role at, um, at the FSA and your role in financial regulation because there's often a dilemma between overregulation and competitiveness. And you've 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 said uh, you yourself have written in articles about how to balance how to make this balance about who guards the guards, who has accountability for regulators, but also not to spook the private sector. Um, could you describe a bit more about how a regulator strikes this balance? Yes, well, with difficulty, I think is the honest answer to that, um, and it of course uh, depends to some extent on what's happening in financial markets. If I look back, yeah. when I joined the FSA in 97, at the time, you know, the city was doing pretty well. Uh, the uh, employment in the city was growing. Um, it was seen as a big competitive advantage to the UK to have a global financial centre. And mm -hmm. the political mood at the time was, you know, we must be careful because this is a goose that lays golden eggs and we don't want mm -hmm. to regulate it in a way that stops the goose laying the eggs. And so all the time I was there, which was, you know, six and a half years or something, um, every time I was in Parliament, 
at the Treasury Select Committee or wherever, all the attacks were from a kind of deregulation yeah. uh, point of view. You know, it was, well, the FSA is too powerful, you're judge and jury in your own case, you're getting in the way of the animal spirits of the city, etc. And so we constantly had to fight off criticism that we were going too far, etc. And uh, that was quite uh, a sort of difficult because we had some legislation which said we had to maintain financial stability and prudential soundness and all of that and consumer mm -hmm. protection. Um, but all the sort of political mood was was against regulation. You know, we were not yeah. popular. Um, and of course, I think that probably remained the case until 2007. And then suddenly this goose that laid golden eggs instead made a very nasty smell. And um, mm -hmm. the financial sector collapsed, more or less, and um, all kinds of people lost a lot of money. Um, and it became clear that uh, you needed much tougher regulation of some parts of the city, I mean, particularly bank capital. And so there's been a process really from 2008, nine onwards up until today of increasing the capital requirements in banks in order to make banks more, more stable. Yeah. Um, now that's been um, fairly uh, clear as a direction of travel, but I would say just looking at the political side, you know, things have begun to change a bit. You can see it most in the US where under Trump, um, you know, they began a, a deregulation of some of the smaller or medium-sized banks. That did not go well uh, because, you know, you can trace the fall of Silicon Valley Bank to some yeah. changes that were made under, under Trump. Here, we haven't had a wholesale pushback, um, particularly not on prudential matters, but the political mood has changed such that people are now saying, well, you know, uh, particularly post-Brexit, uh, is the city really going to be competitive? Do we not need to change our regulation to kind of offset the impact of Brexit? Um, and so the climate has become somewhat different. And now the regulators have been given uh, a subsidiary objective, one should say, of promoting uh, competitiveness. And that's going to make life quite hard for the regulators, in my view, in that trying to work out what you mean by competitiveness is not trivial to start with, um, and then working out how your regulatory environment can try to promote uh, the competitiveness of the, of the sector. So regulators, I think, are faced with uh, always a very difficult balancing act, which is affected by the climate and affected by the uh, success or failure of uh, financial firms. And really, if you write the story of financial regulation for the last 25 years, it's a story of reaction to events. Yeah. But there was equitable life failed uh, during my time, and that resulted in a lot of changes to the way in which life insurance uh, companies and pension companies were regulated. Then, of course, we had Northern Rock, which affected the way banks were regulated, particularly mortgage banks. Um, and then, you know, more recently, um, we've had failures in, uh, you know, in, in, in U.S. banks, which have affected the climate there. And so it's, it's kind of a constant recalibration in the light of, uh, of events. So I, my short answer to your question fundamental underlying question is, I don't think that it makes sense to think of there being one resting place forever, you know, which, where you say, okay, I've now balanced prudential soundness and competitiveness, and I've set it, and that's where we're going to stay. You know, I'm afraid it is going to be affected by events, uh, by political mood, um, and uh, by the also, of course, by what goes on in the rest of the world. So you've got to think of yourself as in the context of a global, a global financial system. So it's a constant balancing act and no point in thinking that you've ever got it right for all time. You know, you're going to constantly have to tweak it. 
I think that leads on nicely to my next question, which is about you know, digital technology and decentralized finance. Now, NatWest is quite famous for its digital capital markets division. Um, and you're saying that regulators are very reactionary. How do you think, you know, regulators can respond to digital finance and how will it change the financial system? But what risks should regulators potentially prepare for instead of reacting to a, a cat catastrophe? Yeah. Well, I think that my own view about the digital finance is that probably in the wholesale markets it should not make a massive amount of difference to the way regulation works because you know wholesale markets are sophisticated counterparties dealing with other sophisticated counterparties and anyone who doesn't equip themselves with the digital technology to deal with more rapid trading and stuff. Well, that's their own lookout, it seems to me. You know, banks can afford to equip themselves with systems to operate in, in a more rapid real-time real uh, marketplace. And if they don't, that's their lookout. They just won't make any money. You know, so I, I, I'm not so worried about it from a regulatory point of view. I think what is more difficult is the retail market where there is a risk that some customers get left behind uh, because they can't manage to operate in the way in which financial firms would like them to because obviously from our point of view i think we're different from anybody else the more customers switch to a digital mode with us the better because it's cheaper you know it's cheaper than having a massive branch network and dealing with lots of cash and everything you know so there's an impulse in the financial system to push consumers towards digital methods of dealing with us. Um, whereas there are, of course, a, a lot of digital natives who love it. And there are lots of particularly older people, but not only older people, who, who just don't love it and, and who yeah. like to get a bank statement and who like to talk to somebody. And um, you know, they, they are uncomfortable about this shift. And the regulators have to decide really how far they're prepared to intervene in order to maintain um, services in a, if you like, a non-digital form for those who cannot adjust and adapt. Now, you know, what is going on is actually that, you know, now something like 90% of the transactions that we process here are done digitally. Um, but, you know, that still leaves 10% of relatively older people who are sort of puzzled by it and, and, and they, do need, they do need some assistance. So I think that's where the digital changes are most acute uh, and trying to maintain services that are appropriate for people who just cannot adapt to it. Now, what we found actually in COVID was that the number of people who were able to adjust to digital ways of handling things grew quite sharply because, of course, they had quite an incentive. You know, people were frightened to go into branches because they thought they might catch COVID. So, you know, if they had an incentive <laughs> as opposed to, to change their behavior. And uh, during COVID, a lot of our branches, which remained open, were actually helping people to get online. You know, so people would come in with their phone or with their laptop or whatever, and our people would sort of explain how to get online and do online banking. And often, you know, I remember going to one branch and talking to one of our staff there who said, look, I know what I'm doing is I'm working myself out of a job because every customer who comes in who might get online and explain how it works, I'm not going to see them again. <laughs> and so there was actually a big jump under COVID. And a lot of the people who sort of said, I don't want to deal digitally, I can't understand it, discovered when they had an incentive that they could. <laughs> but, you know, that still leaves... Uh, a group of elderly people or people with you know not much uh, digital or not much uh, IT education and, and, and or aptitude there's still a, a rump of customers out there who want to deal with you in a different kind of way and I think the regulation needs to allow that uh, and you know we do have the regulators sort of making sure that we don't close branches too quickly or that we leave open uh 
more traditional ways of doing things. You know, if, if you can't write to all your customers and say, uh, excuse me, we're not going to send you back statements anymore. You have to get people to opt in. You know, you have to say, are you happy that in future we send you this digitally? Someone like you, I'm sure, ticks the box straight away. Um, uh, you know, my, uh, my wife kind of thinks about it. And some things she's happy to have digitally, but she also likes a bank statement from time to time. So, you know, people do have different preferences. Um, I'll come back to the idea of, of digital inclusion uh, later on, but I kind of want to get your insight into uh, Brexit because you've been a, a staunch campaigner against Brexit and you call it a significant mistake. Um, what do you think the future impacts of Brexit might be? You know, we've seen a fall in equity listings and a lot of companies moving to continental Europe. But also, what do you think the government and the City of London can do to unlock potentially any potential from Brexit, um, if there is any in your view? Um, yeah, I mean, I I do think Brexit was uh, was a mistake from a from a financial services point of view because um, you know financial services London was doing extremely well inside the EU. People people thought that not joining the euro would be a disadvantage, but that turned out not to be the case. And most of the big European banks did centre their activities in London. It was just the easiest centre, best regulated centre, I would argue. And, um, you know, the deepest labour market. You know, if you're a new bank coming in here and you need to find some risk managers, some compliance people, some uh, treasury people, etc., you know, as long as you're prepared to pay up, you can find them in London. Yeah. So it's, it's quite easy to set up here. So we did extremely well, and we were not only the, if you like, the offshore centre of financial centre of Europe, handling Europe's relations with uh, China, Japan, US, etc., but we were also more or less the onshore centre of Europe. You know, in wholesale markets, certainly. You know, so there were Italian banks who had Italian bankers dealing with Italian companies based in London. You know, mm. uh, so that just was the easiest place to do it. So. I think that the, the risk of Brexit is that we move from being this kind of onshore centre of Europe to the offshore centre of Europe. I still think we're very strong on the offshore dimension to it. Now, yeah. what's happened, however, is that there's been, the move has been relatively slow. I mean, you know, the number of jobs going that you can explicitly see leaving mm -hmm. Probably only sort of seven or eight thousand. I mean, the latest surveys suggest. Although quite a lot of business in, say, equity trading, clearing, etc., has shifted to Amsterdam. Quite a lot of asset management's gone to Luxembourg uh, or to Dublin. Uh, some traders have set up in uh, in Paris, Bank of America, Citibank expanding rapidly in Paris, etc. So you know, it's been a slow process because it was. There's a human dimension here, you know. Um, even the the French have probably been a bit more aggressive than most in trying to pull back business to Paris. Find it's not so easy when their French staff are in London, their mm. children are in the lycée, and they don't want to move. Uh, they actually like their house with a garden, which is quite difficult to replicate in Paris. And so, actually, persuading people to move back is that is not that easy. So there's been a lot of inertia in the marketplace, uh, which has slowed it. But there's not, there's no doubt that there has been a shift. Uh, and I think there will be more of a shift over, over time. Now, what specifically can you do about it from a regulatory point of view is a challenge because most of the foreign institutions based in London like the fact that European and London regulation is broadly still the same, you know, because actually mm. that's rather convenient. For that yeah. So if you want to change regulation, you've got to balance the attraction of devising a perhaps more bespoke version of regulation which suits the particular circumstances of London with the disadvantage of moving away from alignment with the rest of Europe. And if you ask most financial firms whether they want divergence or alignment, most of them will say alignment, please, <laughs> because we don't want to have a 
have to operate a separate set of rules in, in London and a separate set of rules in, in the rest of Europe. There are one or two exceptions to that. The insurance industry is probably one where solvency rules um, you know, have been reformed in London um, and where they regard it as more attractive. But insurance is less, life insurance anyway, is less cross-border. You know, it, it tends to be based on more domestically based. So that's been an, an area where I think we've made some changes which are probably quite uh, helpful. But overall, I'm not sure that there is a lot of mileage in um, regulatory change just to try to offset uh, Brexit. I, I don't, I haven't been able to come across many areas where people will say, oh, well, I'm going to stay in London, I'm going to move to London because you've made this regulatory change mm -hmm. in Brexit. And so the I would say the disadvantages of Brexit have turned out so far to be somewhat less than people, many people forecast. But the advantages of Brexit, I think, are very hard to see. Um, just to kind of follow up on that, a lot of companies are deciding to list in America. Do you think that the FCA can do anything to make uh, the London Stock Exchange a bit more attractive to companies? Um, would that be ideal for London? That's certainly true, um, that there's been a move away from London listings to the US. I don't honestly think that's got a lot to do with Brexit, actually. Uh, I think this is a longer term trend. I'm not sure Brexit's done much to change that. Um, and the underlying reasons for it are, I think, partly, I mean, quite significantly, the fact that the changes in solvency regulation for both pension funds and life insurance companies have caused those people to invest less in equities and more in bonds. Um, yeah. Because uh, the switch from defined benefit to defined contribution pension schemes means that um, they have less appetite for volatile assets that might in the long run produce a higher return, but which are more difficult to match against your fixed liabilities. If you've got a, I'm getting too complicated about this, if you have a defined benefit pension scheme, which new people are coming into all the time, in principle, that is an infinite life, that scheme, because you know, a 22 year old in the past, 22 year old coming out of Warwick would join the defined benefit scheme of BP and be expect to be paying into it till he's 65 and then get yeah. paying, getting out of it for another 20 years. And this, yeah. and then as long as these cohorts, generations renewed, in principle, this was an infinite scheme. And therefore, an infinite scheme doesn't have to worry too much about whether they've got enough liquidity to meet their pensions in any one year. They can afford to take a very long view. And on a very long view, you know, equities do return a higher return that yield than bonds. So as long as you're not worried about being caught out in any particular year, you can have a weighting of equities that's quite high. As soon as you close the scheme and say, right, well, actually, it's now a certain amount of money and we've got to invest that to produce pension returns over a period, which we can see as a finite period, because there's nobody new mm -hmm. coming in. It's a defined contribution scheme. And um, you, you then have to, you then switch to bonds because you have to have a, more certain income against your uh, liabilities. And so the proportion of assets in British pension funds and life insurance companies that were UK equities has fallen extremely sharply. I mean, it's fallen from so 30% to 5% or something like that, depending on which bit of the universe you, you take. Um, and that means that the sort of natural buyers for UK equities have just gone away. Uh, they are, they're not there, you know, lazily in the past, you could assume that you launch a company and people like the Prudential and Lidl and General and Aviva have kind of got to buy it, you know, and the BP yeah. pension fund more or less had to buy it. As soon as you got the index, they kind of had to have it. It's no longer the case. So I think that's the biggest uh, impact on um, 
uh, on London versus New York. It's also related to that, you know, unfortunately, we have had nothing like the same um, big tech companies in, in mm. uh, and a lot of the returns in um, NYSE and in NASDAQ over the last 25, 30 years have been focused on a small number of stocks. If you take Apple, Microsoft, Google, um, and, and, uh, and a few others out of the index, you know, it, the US market does not look as exciting as it does. I mean, you know, we just, and, and where's the UK Amazon in the UK, Apple in the UK, Google, there isn't, there isn't a European one either, by the way. Uh, so I'm afraid some of it is to do with the fact that the US has just ridden the tech boom in a massive way, um, which has made the whole US uh, stock market seem a lot more attractive. And what the FCA can do about this, they've made a few changes um, on things like two-tier equity, two-tier share issues, you know, where some companies in the US, you know, have been happy to list that they want to retain control of the owners. Um, and we, our rules didn't allow that to happen. Our rules require a much larger proportion of shares to be to be traded rather than held. And we don't like, our rules typically don't like these two tier voting structures, whereby the owners can keep a majority of the votes, even if they sell a majority of the shares. We've made some changes to facilitate that kind of thing, which are probably quite sensible and realistic, although some investors don't like it at all actually and say it's a backward step. But I think I'd be quite tolerant of those changes. But will that make, a big difference, you know, if, if you could shift economic activity and trading activity by regulatory changes, I think somebody would have found a way of doing it by now. I, I just don't think that regulation is going to offset the fa factors that have driven the poorer relative performance of London over the last 25, 30 years. Mm. So modestly helpful. Modestly helpful. Um, but not a uh, not likely to be revolutionary. Okay, that, that's a very interesting insight. I, I want to move back to your idea of digital inclusion and just inclusion in general to the financial system, because it seems like it's becoming a lot more complicated. A lot of people feel left out with branches being closed down. Um, do you think like the FCA has a role to include inclusion in the future, which has been um, the, the the leader of the FCA has shut down this possibility? Do you feel that you know the, the the regulators or companies and banks in general should have a role in including everybody in this growing financial system? Well, I'm not sure. I think the FCA are nervous about having a target on financial inclusion, yeah. but the new regulation. Uh, called the consumer duty, which has just been introduced by the FCA, which requires you as an as a financial firm to think about the impact of all of your products and delivery mechanisms on consumers and whether you are harming some consumers by the changes you are making. That actually comes quite close to uh, a focus on financial inclusion because... Mm -hmm. You know, I think under the consumer duty, as I read it, and this is very new, it only came into force at the end of July. But I think if we were to say, do you know what? Um, there's only 5% of our customers who really depend on branches, so we're going to close them all. And, you know, they can just find another way of managing themselves. I think that would fall foul of regulation now. In the, okay. Inarguably, in the past, it would not have done. I mean, you'd have created a political storm uh, and you'd have lost some business, but I don't think you'd have been vulnerable to regulatory action whereas i think now you would be as my reading of the consumer duty because you would be taking a clear decision which uh was in the not in the interests or damaged the interests of a of a group of your of your customers so i think that effectively um there is a um there is a, a financial inclusion dimension to regulation uh, these days there's also, of course, requirements to, to offer kind of basic bank accounts, uh, you know, that are, yeah. that are cheap and easy to access and, and all of that. But one thing that 
I think that uh, the government here has not been disposed to deal with is that, you know, one, one element of financial inclusion has clearly been cash, you know, that everybody can understand cash and, um, mm. you know, that's easy. If you look at, say, New York, I mean, I was struck recently by the fact that in New York, so I, I go quite often, there has been a growing tendency for uh, even coffee shops and then ordinary shops to say, we don't take cash. You know, we just don't. And New York has now passed a law saying that's illegal to not to take cash. Now, that would have quite a big impact. Government doesn't want to do that wants to work entirely through the financial sector uh, to try to promote financial inclusion. Now, I wonder why do they, why do we not think that would be a good idea? Why, why do we not think that, uh, you know, shops should be told that they have to have a provision for dealing in cash? I think that that at the moment is the, the biggest threat to a lot of financial inclusion that people just find they can't spend uh, cash. Mm. Because they aren't, you know, it's not, not available. Uh, now, for younger people, you know, people say it's fine, you know, go to the bar and buy a pint and just flash a card. But, you know, that's not what people of my generation or older um, were, were used to. So if one's serious about financial inclusion, I think things like that are things that ought to be considered. But at the moment, the government's putting the onus entirely on the financial regulators. So it's on us, the onus is on us to provide mm. cash, to make cash available all the time. But the fact that people can't then spend it is not regarded as, you know, so there's no incentive for people to hold cash because increasingly retail outlets don't want to have it. And yet we've got to supply it. So, that, mm. I mean, it seems to me there's a supply and demand side to this. Yeah. And the, the government's working entirely on the supply side and not on the demand side. Uh, just final question. Um, this is more directly related to NatWest Group, but the government obviously um, has a large stake in NatWest, and it's recently sold a, a large stake of that of that share in May this year. Um, how do you think the government's ownership, and as they wind that down, how will that change NatWest? And do you think that'll give you more freedom uh, in the long run? Yes, it will change things for the better. I think. I mean, uh, it's a slightly unusual. I mean, since I've been here, the government's stake has gone down from eighty three to thirty eight. Yeah, and they've been explicit about the fact that they are not holding this stake as a deliberate investment. It's a sort of hangover, you know. So in in corporate terms, it's an asset held for sale. You know, it's not. They're not. They don't have a strategic objective for this shareholding. It's not like they're telling us to do more mortgage business and less unsecured credit. You know, they're not. They don't have a strategic view. It's just. They hold these shares and their aim is to sell them when they find the uh, suitable opportunity. I have to say, when I took over here in 2015, I assumed that if I survived up through to 2023, I assumed the government would have sold all the shares by then. And the reason they haven't is sort of two or threefold, really. One is there was quite a regulatory hangover. We had a big regulatory settlement in 2018 with the US. And before that was settled, you know, the shares were quite difficult to price. Um, and then, but since then, it's really been a combination of, I mean, the government then did start selling after 2018, sold quite a lot. And then we had COVID. And then COVID killed, kicked all the bank share prices down. You know, we went down from three pounds to 95 pence at one point which was absurd and no one would have recommended to the government to sell at 95 pence, that would be ridiculous. So, and then of course, we had a long period uh, through COVID and after of zero interest rates effectively. And of course, banking in a zero interest rate world is quite difficult. It's quite difficult to make money when interest rates are zero. So again, there was a period when bank share prices, not just NatWest. I mean, we've moved up and down with the market, really. Uh, but it was quite difficult for the government to justify selling at that price. Then it picked up again, um, you know, earlier this year, and we sold, we've sold some, uh, the government sold some, we bought some shares back, I think. 
but it has taken an awful lot uh, longer. And undoubtedly, it would be advantageous if the government could sell the rest of its holding uh, fairly soon. I mean, there's some technical reasons for that, which is that you know people like liqui liquidity in stocks. And if you've got 38% of the, of, the, of the value of the stock sort of locked up in one holder, you know, the liquidity is lower. So from all points of view, really, it would be good if the government sold its uh, outstanding stake. Uh, it's their intention to, and as far as I know, the Labour Party will intend to as well. So they don't yeah. want to hold it for some strategic purpose. It's just waiting for the <coughs> moment when they think the price is... Uh, a decent price to sell. Uh, well, I think that's a great place to wrap up. Uh, thank you, Howard, for doing this uh, interview. And it's been very insightful to learn about the role of regulation and how you think that it, it won't be able to earn enough to ignite London, but has a role in digital inclusion potentially. Um, that really, thank you for doing this. Uh, it will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Um, and thank you, the audience, for listening. Uh, you can check the next episode um, in the future. Thank you, okay. Salad. Thank you. Bye. Bye.